Bevin. And we're going to start reading from verses 1 to 16. And we're going to read, we're going to study verses 3 to 16. One Corinthians chapter eleven. Going to read the first one. Not second. One sec. I'm not used to manual. I usually go digital. So. One Corinthians eleven. Did you yeah. say? And what's the verse? <laughs> verse one. <laughs> Not that read that verse one. One. I uh, know it's eleven. Verse one. One. No. Oh. oh, okay. Imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying having his head covered dishonours his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonours dishonors her head. For that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. For if a woman <coughs> is not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man is not formed from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. For this reason the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, because of the angels. Nevertheless, Neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman. But all things are from God. Judge among yourselves, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonour to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory, for her hair is given her for the covering. But if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. Now, if there's one passage of scripture in the Bible that has caused more discussion, yeah. more division, and more speculation than this passage, and the passage of scripture that is most un, 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 understood, that's what I was going to say, people do just do not understand what's written here. Misunderstood. It is one of those passages of scripture that people have misunderstood for centuries. And people have preached on it, and I've heard some really stupid things spoken about this passage of scripture. I have checked with some of the most influential commentators on the Bible from the last hundreds of years, and some of them just throw their hands up and say, we haven't got a clue what Paul is talking about. Now it seems straightforward. And in fact, it is straightforward. But it's not as straightforward as people think. Some of the attempts to explain this go from the sublime to the ridiculous, really. So let's have a look at it. Now, 
when I was a boy, I asked my mother, why don't you go to church? And she said, I don't go to church because I haven't got a hat. And I thought, well, that's pretty stupid. What's that got to do with it? Having a hat. So the question arises, is this got anything to do with women wearing hats? I, I, I remember going to a Pentecostal church in the 1960s and all the women were wearing these great big fashion hats and they were all wearing miniskirts. And there was a there was a podium, you know, a, a stage at the front of the church, like what we've got. And these women would go and they would step up onto the stage to go and sing. And when they stepped up on the stage with their miniskirts, you could see their underwear. And I commented on it and I said, why are you wearing a hat when I can see your underwear? And I was told I shouldn't look. That was the answer. But it, it's just so ridiculous that <coughs> people do these things out of tradition and they think they're doing something wonderful and it's, and if you ask them can you give me a scripture they will point you to this scripture now there's nothing in there about a woman wearing a hat nothing at all if you go back into the greek there's nothing there about having their head covered with a except one very small reference where it could mean having a veil over your face. Could mean. But there's a little bit of doubt about that as well. But there is nothing here about wearing a hat, putting on a scarf, or anything else. I mean, why would it matter anyway? Because a lot of people make a big thing about it. Yeah, but why would God care? Well, let's... let's about let's, whether you wear a hat or not. Well, this is the thing. So what is it, what is it that he is on about? The real teaching here is basically the difference between men and women. That's what it's about. It's not wearing hats or covers or anything else. It's about the difference between men and women. The different roles and different responsibilities. There's nothing here that says women are inferior to men, which is what well, is taught by a lot of women pastors. That this is a terrible passage of scripture because women are under men. So we're, we're, we're made to un inferior. Well, if that is so, then we have a problem. Because it says quite, quite specifically, Christ is the head of man, Ma man is the head of woman, and God is the head of Christ. So if women are inferior to men, logically speaking, men would then be inferior to Christ, and also logically speaking, Christ would be inferior to God, which cannot happen. Jesus, the Word, is God. He is equal with the Father. The Scripture teaches us very plainly, I'm not going to look at these Scriptures, but the Scripture teaches us very plainly that in Christ there is neither male nor female. We are equal. We are equal with each other and we are equal with Christ and Christ is equal with God. Now that's a profound statement that the scripture makes. 
And Paul here is not talking about an hierarchy of inferior people. He's talking about different aspects, different roles. What is the role of a man and what is the role of a woman? One of the problems that we have in today is that our culture is totally different to what the culture was of the, in the days that Paul was writing this letter. So it's very difficult to uh, understand the culture. But the culture today in the church seems to me that the church is following the world instead of leading the world. And what happens in the world happens in the church. And we're seeing it all around us. And the church should be leading, not adopting the ideas of the world. God created man and woman different. And there is a great difference between men and women. And when we worship God, those differences should be apparent. I'll explain what I mean in a moment. God wants to see womanly women, not women who are pretending to be men. God wants to see manly men. And that's the problem that we have in the church. Is there is a great lack of manly men. There might be a lot of men, but whether they're manly is another question. Basically, and I will deal with this on Sunday morning as well, basically, Men are quite happy to sit back and let women do, do it. Because men are basically lazy. We like an easy life. And if the women are prepared to do the work, we'll sit back and let them do it. But when it comes to the things of God, there is an order. And God has given men certain responsibilities and he's given women certain responsibilities. And that's what Paul is talking about <coughs> here, the different roles between men and women. So this passage of scripture is about the head. God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of man. Man is the head of woman. So the passage tells us, right, plainly there should be a distinction a visible distinction between men and women. When women 
try to be like men, they're rebelling against God. When men try to be like women, they're rebelling against God. They're rebelling against his order. And as I say, the world goes in one direction and the church follows. Instead of leading, they take the way of least resistance. We're not going to stand up and fight, we're just going to <laughs> submit. There are those who stand up and say, this is wrong, but they're shouted down by others. And because the church doesn't speak with one voice, there is division, and where there is division, there's weakness. But what God is talking about here is the head. My duty as a husband is to protect my wife. That's my duty. When I come to church, my wife comes with me. It's my duty to make sure that what is being preached is right. And if it's wrong, then I have to tell my wife that was wrong. Now, I am in a very envious position that my wife can turn around to me and say, that wasn't right, was it? <laughs> because she knows the word uh, as, as good as I do. But is that all that there is in there? Man, responsibility is to protect his wife. Not only in church, but that's his general responsibility. Oh, of course, he's going to come up with all sorts of, 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 of anomalies. What about people who don't have a wife? What about women who haven't got a husband? All oh, this, oh, well, we, we, we can look at that. But that's just red heavens. But Paul brings in something here. This is where I'm going to challenge you. This is where I'm going to ask you, do you really believe the Bible? Paul It says here in verse 10, for, the, for this reason the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Because of the angels. Now I've said this, and my, as a husband, it's my responsibility to protect my wife. I am the authority on her head. Not a hat, not a scarf, me. This, sorry, this, this one's um, a yeah. very, very, yeah, yeah. Um, strange one. It says it here, for this cause ought the woman to have power on her head yeah. because of the angels. Right. Now that word power, that word power, when they translated the word power, that is a symbol of authority. Okay. This, this is old language. Uh, yeah. Is, this yeah. Is yeah. Ancient language. Yeah. When you go back to the original Greek, the word power in the original in the original there could 
being interpreted as a veil. Mm. A veil. It's, it's so obscure that it is really difficult. Mm -hmm. In this new tradition, it says a symbol, a symbol, something, you know, because the word power has been, is, is so different now to what it was back then. In, in, back then. Okay. That's why it's so difficult to use the King James Version, because language has changed. Mm. Because of the angel. So, what are you saying is a symbol of authority a, that her husband's got? Yeah. Okay. A symbol of authority on her head. On her head. So, uh, on her head. Christ is the head, my head. Yeah. He's the symbol of authority on my head. I'm the symbol of authority on yeah. my wife. But it doesn't mean literally a symbol on your head. No. Mm -hmm. no. Exactly. No. And obviously, the, because of the angels, now you'll have to lay it down for us because yes. I've got no idea. No, but where we're going to go, this is where I'm going to challenge you, really challenge you. Now, I was looking up on some of the <coughs> Greeks to see what they had to say about this before I put my tempano within. And none of them, none of them, can explain this about the angels. And yet it's very simple. If we understand the scriptures, and if we believe the scriptures. Let me guess. There's a reference for that somewhere else, you just have to know where. Exactly. So that's what we're going to look at. Because this is the important part. And if we can grasp this, then we know what Paul is talking about in the first place. But I say you're going to, going to challenge you now whether you believe the scriptures or not. Because this is really hard stuff. We're going to start by having a look at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, verse 26. Did you say 16? 17, 26. What? 17, 26. Would you read that one again, Michael? Michael. <laughs> and as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. Carry on. Yeah, just, yeah. Yeah, just do the next one, yeah. Because yeah. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted and built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. all right. So, Jesus says, the same conditions will apply in the world as, in, as, a, as they were in the days of Noah, before Noah went into the ark. And we know from scripture that in the days of Noah, we are told there was great wickedness in the world. Great wickedness in the world. And Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so also in the days of the Son of Man. So we can see the signs of, signs of the times and the coming of Jesus as we see that the world is getting, what, more wicked.
And people go about their daily lives, they get married, they get families, they go into jobs, they do everything, but the world progressively gets more wicked. The world in the day of Noah, we are told, was full of violence. Read it up for yourself in the Old Testament. The, the days of Noah was full of violence. I don't know if you've noticed that there's a lot of violence around nowadays. A lot of violence. It's surprising how violent society has become. And when I was a boy, if you heard about a murder, that was something extreme. Now, it's nearly every day that you're hearing about a murder. I can remember when I was in, in, in secondary school, there was a murder in Grimsby. A little girl was murdered in Willsby Wood, which is in Grimsby. And it, it was beyond belief. Everybody was in uproar about it. How could it happen in Grimsby? That the, there was a murder in Grimsby. It never, you know, it was such a, a rare occurrence. And yet today, it seems to be not in Grimsby, but when you, when you listen to the news or read the newspapers, there's a murder somewhere just about every day. And children are getting killed. Unbelievable how many children are being killed, murdered. Violence is on the increase. Corruption on a big scale. If we're not living in the days of Noah now, we soon will be. What's this got to do with angels? Let's have a look at the book of Jude. 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 As in like, hey Jude. Hey Jude. Jude. Just before Revelation. Just before, just before Revelation. Yeah. Oh, he didn't get much in the Bible, mm -hmm. did he? One page. After one John three. One and a half page you got. That's you know. Harsh. There you are. There you are. Jude. Verse six. Verse seven. And the angels, who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains and the darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and going after strange flesh, and set forth as an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Oh! Oh! Jude says about these angels. Angels who left their proper domain, 
left their abode, left where they should have been, and went somewhere else. Went somewhere else. Where else could they go? Jude says it about Sodom and Gomorrah. Having given themselves over to sexual immorality and going after strange flesh. Angels leaving their abode and participating in the same sin is he talking That's about Sodom and Gomorrah? Is it talking about people who believed and then just turned away from that? Angels who went and had sex. Oh, we're getting into something here, aren't we? Let's have a look at Peter. Two Peter. Or is he talking about women who are, what's the nice word? Harlots, I think, is the nice word. Mm -hmm. I got a few words, but I don't want to, you know. Let's have a look at uh, Peter, chapter 2. 2 Peter, second letter of Peter. Can I'm too far back, Janet. I'm going too far. I don't know. Which one did you say? Peter, 2 Peter. 2 Peter, chapter, chapter 2. two. Two Peter two. Oh, there's Peter. Two Peter. I can't see very good. My eyes are not like the ones that focus. Mm. Two Peter. Two is uh, chapter two. Chapter four. Chapter two, verses four to six. Oh, two. For God did not spare the angels who sinned. No. Angels who sinned. Did you know angels could sin? Mm. Hey? No. There you are. God did not spare the angels who sinned. Lucifer was an angel and he sinned. <laughs> what? He sinned. But cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. And did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterwards would live ungodly. So Peter and Jude talk about angels who have sinned and both of them compare the sin to Sodom and Gomorrah. And we know that the biggest, one of the big sins in Sodom and Gomorrah, not the biggest, but one of the big sins in Sodom and Gomorrah was illegal sex or unlawful sex, and sex, be sex between people who shouldn't have sex together. So let's go to the book of Genesis. Oh, oh so that's what he meant by strange flesh. Well, we shall see. So I got it wrong, it's not women, it's we'll see. everybody. Which did you say? Genesis? Genesis, the first book of the Bible. No, no, that, I know that much. <laughs> yes. which, which one, Ray? Chapter 6. Six. 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 Yep. Verse 6. Yep. Verse 4. Four. Bear with me, 
a giant on the earth in those days and also afterwards when the sons of God came to the daughters of men they bore children to them and they were mighty men who were of old men of renown have you read that? the sons of God who are the sons of God? well we don't have to speculate because the Bible tells us if you go to the book of Job, Job chapter 1, and in the first chapter of Job, it says the sons of God appeared before God, the throne of God. They were angels. Angels. And they had sex with women. And the women bore sons who were giants. And it says there, afterwards, after what? After the flood. They continued after the flood. Challenging, isn't it? I thought after the flood there was only certain ones that went into the ark of the coffee and I went in and didn't stay that way, Jenna. <laughs> If it had stayed that way, you and I wouldn't be here, would we? <laughs> well, how 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 does it how um, how do we know it's after um, Noah? There were giants on the earth in those days. That is before the flood. Yeah. And also afterwards. Yeah, but how does it relate? Sorry, I just, I'm trying, you know, as you can imagine, I have no idea. When what? the sons of God, which are angels, came to the daughters of men, which are women, yeah. and they bore children to them. Okay. Yeah, um. mm -hmm. Alright, got you. Okay. <laughs> no, no. <clears throat> This whole chapter is about Noah, that's why. Okay. It's all about Noah. Yeah, yeah. The, before the, the, word, the flood. Yeah, sorry, I just. Uh, sorry, I didn't yeah. realize that the chapters before and after are actually the arc story and everything. So, okay, makes sense now. Okay, so if this Bible, if the Bible is correct, if this is true. <coughs> That's why I asked you, do you believe the Bible? If this is true, then that gives an insight into what Paul is talking about when he says, because of the angels. Paul didn't view the church as being a small group of people meeting together anywhere in the world. And I, mean, I say a small group of people. Even if you've got a, a mega church of 5,000, 10,000 or 20,000 people, compared to the rest of mankind and the world's population, that is just a small group of people. There's no such thing really as a mega church. Paul viewed the worldwide church and he viewed the worldwide church as interacting with heaven and, 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 a, and a lot of what happens in the church today is, is on this level My, my whole teach us quite a bit about worship and, 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 and I think he's sometimes quite frustrated by the lack of worship. Worship is interacting with heaven. 
and a, and a lot of what we call worship is nothing more than this, interacting with each other. And Paul viewed the church as interacting with heaven. Interacting with God, interacting with Jesus, interacting with the Holy Spirit, interacting with the angels. Oh. You see, for Paul, participation in an act of worship wasn't just a, a, a human experience. Angels and heavenly beings were part and parcel of that worship. It's an interaction between earth and heaven. So what's the problem? Paul saw that when we come together to worship, angels are present. Angels are participating with us in worship. If we are truly worshipping God, angels are participating with us in that worship. When we, when we truly worship God, when we sing hallelujah, 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 when we pray and praise and thank the angels are praying and praising and thanking with us. That's why it's so important that when we come together to worship, when we come together to praise and to thank God, that we do it. We, 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 we sort of said uh, in between the hymns it's time to just to say thank you Lord or praise God or just to say just to worship God in this, in, in, in spirit and in truth. The only two people who have ever done anything is Mike and I. Everybody else sits there with their mouth shut. It's not a time to say we want to pray for our granny who's sick or for our next door neighbor or something like that. It's a time to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for Jesus. The other, the other week, Michael said, start off by thanking God. And then he said, well, if you don't think you've got anything to thank God for, say, well, I thank you that I've got a house to live in. Thank you that I got food to eat. Thank you that I got cross. If you can't say that, say thank you, Lord, for the cross of Christ. I totally agree with him, 100%. We've always got something to be thankful for. To get out of bed. That's a start. Not everyone can do that. Just to say thank you. Thank you. Just to open your mouth and say thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for my wife. Thank you for my children. Thank you for my home. Thank you for my work. Thank you for all the good things you've given to me. It's not difficult. It's not difficult. Well, don't you think we do that? Um, rape, even before I go out to bed, I thank God that he's looked after me through the night and protect me with horrible dreams. And we do that all the time, but I don't. <laughs> What I'm talking about is when we come together to pray, and when we come together, not what you're doing at home, but what you, you do when we come together. But the question arises then, can the wrong type of the angels be present? If we come together and we're not coming together right, are we opening the door for the wrong type of angels to be there? It, 
even if we are coming together right, is it possible for the wrong type of angels to be there? Well, reading what the Apostle Paul says, yes, there can be good angels there, but there can also be evil angels there. So, wouldn't the good angels know? <coughs> well, let's just have a look. I, I, I mentioned it, but just let's have a look at the book of Job. If you want to find Job, Janet, go to the book of Psalms and go back from the book of Psalms and you get to the book of Job. Chapter 1, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came along with them. Notice that. But the angels came before the Lord, and Satan came with them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and for walking back and forth on it. Okay, what's my point? The other angels didn't recognize Satan. The sons of God came, the angels came before the Lord, Satan came with them and he was there mingled with them They didn't notice him until God said, hey, what are you doing here? Where did you come from? So that would mean they don't know one another well enough. They look the same. They look the same. An angel of light, shining, brilliant, bright. Oh. All angel. clothed the same. Satan masquerades, we are told as an angel of light. Mm. So they didn't recognize him. Well, it also do not really say how many there are, <laughs> does it? Yes. Does it? There is a third, third of evil. A third of all the angels went with Satan. Now, if we, if we, if we take that there are millions and millions of angels. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Is a third of yeah. a third of them. There's a lot of them. Yeah, that, it, it's easier to hide in a crowd. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Because yeah. if it was like two, and, and there's a third guy, it was like, well, hang on a sec. <coughs> so we can be present, worshiping God. The angels are present, good angels, but also some other angels. And what are those angels doing? <coughs> Praying on you, I guess. Well, one of the things they're doing is they're looking at my wife. And it's my job to be her head, her protection. But they're also looking at me So you got to look to Christ. So Jesus is my protection. So that's why you said that you can tell your wife that, that wasn't actually right. Because it could have been like a false teaching or something like that. Gotcha. Okay. Power. Another word for power is authority. Mm -hmm. Women have to have authority on their head. Keep them safe. Well, that's not that they're 
it's not their authority to do something. It's not their there. authority over them. It's authority over them. Right. So me, as my wife's husband, I have the authority to protect her. Christ has the authority to protect me, and God has the authority to protect Christ. In other words, we are all under protection. Hallelujah. It's got nothing to do with putting an hat on. It's got nothing to do with all these silly symbols and things. It's about having authority. Yeah, it just seems to me that the Bible is not very literal, so why would you <laughs> translate it or, or, or try to understand it literally? Because if you would, so, I mean, man, we probably wear sandals in the winter or something. So we can say we are under the authority of Christ who is protecting us from everything that we need protecting from. Okay, so Paul gives the answer that we're looking for when he tells women to have a suitable covering under there. So by this he affirms this, that they are under the authority of Christ. And they are protecting themselves from pure, from impure spiritual influences. Now, of course, the question comes, you're talking about I'm a husband protecting my wife. What about what about little girls? Well, they come under the protection of their father. What about unmarried women in the church whose fathers are not in the church? Well, that's not a problem. They come under the protection of the church elders. No problem if we read the scriptures and we know what the Bible teaches. There's no problem. Now, why, why, what, what, what we're doing it? Well, the first thing is we've got to give due respect where due respect is due. <laughs> yeah. So I have to show respect to Christ. I have to show respect to the Father. I have to show respect to the Holy Spirit. In other words, I've got to res show respect to the Trinity. And I've got to show due respect to those who are more powerful than I am. And that is the good angels. Now they are ministering spirits. They come to minister to me. But they're more powerful than I am, so I need to show them some respect. But we need to show God respect. And this is something, again, that is lacking, I believe, in the church today. Let's go to the book of Malachi. The book of what? Mal Malachi, I should say. Malachi. Right, where do we find that? Well, we just go to the book of Matthew and go back one. The book of Matthew and go back Chapter 1, verse 6. A son honours his father, a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honour? If I am a master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts, to you priests, who despise my name. 
Yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? You offer defiled food on my altar. <coughs> but saying, in what way have we defiled you? By saying, the table of the Lord is contemptible. Oh there, there's a sermon and three quarters in there, isn't there? But what we're looking at is that God charges these people, Israel, that he, they don't respect him. They don't honour him. He charges the priests in... Uh, he charges the priests in... The priest. um, yeah. Yeah. But when we come to the New Testament, we have to remember that we are all priests. Yes, they were all priests. Because priest. yeah. priest, like, there was no need for actual... And God charges his people here with insincerity, insincerity in what? In worship. They're not worshipping him properly. And they, they were very religious. Somebody said to what their greatest enemy to to Christianity is religion. That's true. Yeah, it is. Simple. Because it has rarely anything to do with faith. These people were very religious, yet they were very irreverent. And now when we go to verse 14, But cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male and takes a vow, but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. There are certain rules, the rules of conduct, which govern the way people relate to their leaders. We call that protocol, don't we? And God has his protocol. And out of respect for God and for our own best interest, we need to follow the requirements of heaven's protocol when we come to God. Let's have a look. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 9. God has displayed us, the apostles, last, as men condemned to death, for we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. Both to angels and to men. <coughs> Let me just whip over to the book of Hebrews. Chapter 1, <coughs> give us chapter 1. Verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit the salvation? Okay, so we're talking about angels, ministering spirits. 
who performed priestly acts of worship. So, here again, in the early church, it was taken for granted that heaven and earth were united in worship. How oh, it would be wonderful, really wonderful, if we could get back to truly worshipping God. Really. And, and I, I know Michael has the same desire. Sometimes you want to throw yourself into it. And, and, and you're sat in a, in a congregation and either they're all clapping, singing, waving their hands around them. And, and, and you think, what am I doing here? I've got nothing against people putting their hands up in the air. I've got nothing against people clapping. I've got nothing against people dancing. But when it's just for, for sure. my benefit, yeah. when it's just to make me feel good, that's not worship, that's not praise, that's just selfishness. But uh, some of it could genuinely be... Some of it is genuine. Yeah, like, you know, out of the actual uh, happiness of, uh, of, of God. I say, I'm, I've got nothing against it. I've got nothing against people clapping, I've got nothing against people putting hands up in the air and worship. I've got nothing against people dancing. But when it becomes me centered. Yeah, yeah. But then again, what if, when it becomes me centered. There's no benefit in just dancing out of but, nothing, right? Yeah. It becomes artificial. Yeah. It becomes forced. People doing it because they think they should be doing it. Yeah. I know, I, I get exactly what Ray means. I absolutely agree because I won't dance until 